this is Joey Pusateri broadcasting from my office at First Christian Church, Disciples of Christ of Danville, Kentucky, and I bring you greetings, peace, and grace from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, today we're going to pick up our Bible study with uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, verses 2 through 8, which reads, And just then some people were carrying a paralyzed man lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Then some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blasphemy. But Jesus, perceiving their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Stand up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, Stand up and take your bed and go home. And he stood up and went to his home. When the crowd saw it, they were filled with awe, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to human beings. This is the word of God for the people of God. May God add a special blessing to the hearing of this word. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this time together to study your word. We ask that by the movement of your spirit, our minds might be illuminated to discern your will and your wisdom. And... Uh, we ask that your spirit would stir within us and encourage our hearts to take what we have discerned and to live it out in our lives, which reflect the kingdom of God. It's the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who reigns within that kingdom that we pray. Amen. One of my favorite stories, I know I've said that before, and I'll probably say it again. One of my favorite stories uh, in the Gospels. We actually see it repeated in all three of the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And uh, Mark is probably my favorite version because that's the one where they tear a hole in the roof and they lower the man down uh, on the mat. I don't recall off the top of my head how Luke tells the story, if they have that detail or not. In Matthew's version, uh, it says that Jesus has just returned from the land of the Gadarenes, uh, Gentile territory, and now he's back home. Uh, it doesn't say that he's in a building or anything. There's really no description of kind of where this takes place. But the way it's written, it seems to me, the image that comes to mind is that Jesus is walking along with a crowd of people around him, and some other people approach him with a mat upon which there is a paralyzed man. And there is a forgiveness of sins, and then there's a healing that occurs, uh, and then uh, we see what happens from there. All right, so there's a lot of things going on. I just want to lift a few things out in this text. The central thing I think that we need to notice and pick up on is that we now see the beginning of a new conflict, right? So the Gospel of Matthew, I've said this before, so I won't repeat myself too much, is all about a clash of kingdoms, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdoms of this world. And before now, we have seen the kingdoms of this world be represented by different uh, powers, you know, whether they be human powers or supernatural powers. And now we have a new power which stands in the place of the kingdoms of this world against which we have the kingdom of heaven, you know, coming into conflict with. And so what now stands in the place of the kingdoms of this world is religious institutions. So we have political power, we have supernatural power. Now we have uh, religious institutions. Now what's important to notice is that uh, Jesus is not anti-Jewish. He, he's a Jew, right? Like, how could he be anti-Jewish? So this is not an indictment against Judaism. He's not uh, destroying the law or saying that the law is bad. Quite the contrary, he's already told us in the uh, Sermon on the Mount that he's not here to abolish the law or replace the law. He's here to fulfill the law. What he's saying is that I'm the one that the law points to. And he uh, interprets the law in the proper way, which gets at the heart of what God's intentions are for us. That's the point. What's, um, what, what stands as an oppositional force against the kingdom of heaven is corrupt religious institutions. And there's a difference, right? And this exists even today. You know, we have Christian faith, we have God, we have the power of the Holy Spirit working in the world. We have people who seek to dedicate their lives to the kingdom of God and following Jesus, being the disciples of Jesus. And then on top of that, all around us, we have religious institutions. And in our faith, we call that the church or ecclesiastical uh, institutions and structures and so forth. And they are subject to becoming corrupt. Why? Because they're comprised of human beings, they're ordered by human beings, and they are susceptible to being influenced by human sin. And so people get into positions of power within these, within these institutions 
uh, and either the way that they execute the power or the way they organize the institution ends up becoming um, oppressive, you know, for example, or unfaithful, either by design or unintentionally. And uh, that has always been the case. So the scribes represent corrupt religious institutions. It's not an indictment against Jewish faith. It's an indictment against the institution, the structure, the organization around it. So the scribes uh, confront Jesus. Uh, well, the way what, what happens is Jesus forgives the sins of this paralyzed man, and then he hears their thoughts, which again is just a little detail to remind us the power and authority of Jesus. He hears their thoughts, and what they're thinking is this man is blaspheming because only God has the power to forgive sins. So if he's uh, forgiving sins, then he is saying that he has the power of God, hence that is blasphemy. And so Jesus questions this and challenges this and says, why do you think evil thoughts in your heart? And then he says this, he says, now which is easier to say that someone's sins are forgiven or to say to someone, pick up your mat and walk, right? Well, what would be easier is to say your sins are forgiven. Why? Because there's no physical manifestation, there's no visible evidence of that being true. Um, so, you know, wh whether or not your sins are forgiven is kind of something in between you and you and God. And um, so it'd be easier to say that because there's no way to prove whether or not it happened. It would be much harder to say, take up your mat and walk, because after all, if you have no authority to heal somebody and you say that and they can't get up and walk, then you are exposed as a fraud, right? So he says, which is easier to say? And of course, the answer is to say your sins are forgiven. So he says this, just so you know that I have the power to do what I just said, you know, was happening, which is that his sins are forgiven, I will say this. Then he turns to the paralytic and says, you know, get up, take your bed and walk. And he does. And that demonstrates his power and his authority and centrally to forgive sins. Now, there's a few things that I want to point out here, which I think are really important in addition to that. So that's kind of the central thing, the central conflict between Jesus and the scribes who represent corrupt religious institutions. And that'll be something that really draws itself out for the rest of the gospel. Now, um, the first thing that I want to point out, this detail, is that when, he, for, when Jesus forgives the man's sins, it comes in a response to their faith. It says, seeing their faith, he says to the man, your sins are forgiven. So who, who is they? Well, they are the people who brought the man on the mat to Jesus in the first place. And isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? You know, the values of this world that we live in tend to be more along the lines of a meritocracy, you know, meaning that if you earn something, you get something, right? And it, it all makes sense. I'm not saying that's a bad way to be. It's just a limited human way to be, right? Uh, and it has its own problems. So um, we would say that, you know, if, if the man on the mat demonstrated enough faith, then he would deserve to have his sins forgiven, and then Jesus would do it. But that's not what it says. It says seeing their faith, seeing the faith of the people that brought him to him, he forgives his sins. That's the way the kingdom works. In other words, the kingdom is this type of place and environment. It's this type of, you know, um, um, you know, divinely ordered society, community, whereby the faith of other people matter in your life. Or in other words, your faith matters to other people. So let's say that you know you and I and a group of people, we all had a friend who was suffering something greatly. They just found out they had a terrible diagnosis and they're just lost in despair and anger and hurt and pain and all of those things. And in some certain ways, they're you know paralyzed, you might say. They don't have the ability to function and do the things that they you know need to be doing. The fact that we could all come together and pray for this person and that we could have faith that God can heal this person, even though they might not be able to believe it themselves at that time, that makes a difference. And that our faith is enough to, to have God respond positively to our faith for the sake of other people. And that's good news. I'm amazed that the kingdom works that way because we don't work that way. The other thing, and then I'll let you go, that I want to point out here is that there's a response to the healing, right? So he says, get up your mat and you know walk and go home. And so he gets up and he walks. Now, when he does this, there's a crowd of people around him, you know? And it doesn't say, you know, like, you know, take this man on the mat and carry him out of here. And when he gets home, he'll be able to, you know, get up and walk later on. Like he heals him right there in the crowd so that the healing is public 
so that people have an opportunity to see it and to respond, which they do by glorifying God. And that reminds me of, say, you know, somebody who uh, had an addiction and they were alcoholic or a drug addict or whatever, and then they get sober by the grace of God, and then they're out in public and people see them and they're like, wow, like I don't remember you know, her looking like that. I don't remember him looking like that. Like, is that so-and-so the, you know, the person that couldn't be trusted, the person that created all this harm in our society, the person that was destroying themselves with chemicals? I mean, look at him now, you know, he or she looks great. And when that happens, people can't help but, you know, think to themselves, well, why? Like, why has this person uh, been able to be transformed? And if this person is not ashamed, you know, if this person is freely willing to, you know, be public about how they have recovered, then it brings glory to that which got them sober, you know, and, and there would be an opportunity to say, you know, God has healed me, and that brings glory to God. And so not only does the faith of, say, a crowd of people have a positive influence on getting an individual healed, but the public display of a healing has a positive influence on a crowd of people who all, you know, can come to glorify God. And uh, it just goes to show that it's not all about us, <laughs> right? It just goes to show that the kingdom is this type of environment, this type of society that is radically selfless and egalitarian and uh, where we are bound together, reconciled to one another and sharing the love of God that is within us. All right, that is plenty. I hope you have a wonderful day and we'll see you soon.